Welcome to part two of Sylvan Kaufman's webinar, Ecology Basics for Landscapers and Designers. This is one webinar in a series presented by the Ecological Landscaping Association in collaboration with the Midwest Ecological Landscape Alliance, the Chesapeake Conservation Landscape Council, and Ecolandscape California. This webinar was originally presented live on September 17, 2013. The next cycle we'll look at is the carbon cycle. Carbon occurs mostly as carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but there are also trace amounts of methane and carbon monoxide. Plants uptake carbon in the form of carbon dioxide through photosynthesis, um, but this uptake is approximately equal to the amount of carbon released through respiration by primary producers, consumers, and decomposers. I often find that people forget that plants uh, not only photosynthesize, but they also respire, just like other organisms do. Carbon becomes stored in terrestrial and aquatic systems long term as fossil fuel, peat, soils, and carbonate rock. For shorter periods of time, it's stored in plant and animal biomass, including what biomass is used to produce such, such things as paper or wooden houses. The ocean stores large amounts of carbon too, and there's increasing concern because ocean water has become more acidic as carbon dioxide levels have risen. Carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere have risen substantially since 1750 due to human activities. This figure shows measurements of carbon dioxide from prehistoric times to the present. So on all three of these graphs, the concentration of carbon dioxide is shown on the y-axis and um, the years are shown on the x-axis. So you can see that there's always been fluctuation in CO2 levels, but CO2 levels now are way above what they ever have been historically in the past. Zooming in a little bit, you can see that um, this spike started uh, in the around the 1700, 1700s, 1800s, around the time of Industrial Revolution. And here, in, since 1950, you can see the increase of carbon dioxide from about 310 parts per million to 380 parts per million. And, and so again, this is way above what Earth has experienced in the past. And, um, and this is due mainly to um, the burning of fossil fuels. Deforestation contributes to um, carbon dioxide increases as well, but often these increases are balanced by the regrowth of crops or new tree cover. The loss of vegetation results, uh, the loss of vegetation also results in the release, release of carbon dioxide that, is, that are stored in soils, and that's become an increasing, um, something that people are increasingly look at looking at is the loss of carbon dioxide from soils. I included here two things that are related to, um, to landscaping more particularly. One is the production of cement, um, which contributes to about 2.4 percent of the global emissions from industrial and energy sources. And then peat moss harvesting, which is a relatively small contributor, but peat moss stores a lot of carbon dioxide and it's something that's commonly used in the nursery and landscaping industries. At, a global, at the global scale, changing landscaping practices may have relatively little influence on atmospheric carbon dioxide levels, but consider using um, more fuel efficient equipment, reducing the use of peat moss and concrete products, reducing soil disturbance, and planting more plants to uh, absorb carbon dioxide. The rising carbon dioxide levels are coupled with rising temperatures, and both will have major consequences for landscapers. Plants initially respond to higher carbon dioxide levels by increasing their rate of growth, but growth is limited by many resources, and so once plants are so plants eventually are going to be limited by water and nutrient limitations in particular. And scientists have already seen that when they're studying growth rates in forests that the growth rates level out after several years of increased carbon dioxide levels. 
Some unexpected consequences of carbon dioxide increases that have been discovered are that ragweed increases its pollen production along with other weedy plants. And poison ivy leaves have greater toxicity and uh, greater and there's production of more leaves. So that's very bad news for us landscapers. Temperature changes have already resulted in plants shifting their ranges northward or up in elevation. There's much concern that that could lead to the loss of species if their shift, if their shift in ranges is blocked by inhospitable habitat, like you saw in that uh, picture of the Bethesda area, where it would just be difficult for plants and animals to to, to move uh, on their, under their own auspices. It further emphasizes the importance that urban and suburban habitats could have in linking natural areas. So uh, now I want to try doing a second poll. So Risa, if you can put up poll number two. Okay, I'm going to do that. And in the meantime, while, okay, so poll number two, which is about the climate change in your area, we're going to launch that. Um, and Sylvan, while people are taking the poll, okay, so the poll is, how do you most notice climate change in your region? Um, and while you're doing that, I had another question, which I thought I could forward to you, but I can't, so maybe you can answer it. It's from mm -hmm. uh, Michelle Krugel, and she says, how does making of cement impact the carbon cycle? Uh, okay, so the making of cement, um, uses basically it uses a lot of energy to produce the cement and so um, uh, the fossil fuels that are used in the production are uh, what's contributing to carbon dioxide okay so um, now you in your poll we're get all the votes are coming in um, you had a poll where you had to select one of the following but someone in the questions uh, they t they said to me that all of the they're seeing all of the above so <laughs> in terms of the changes you know in their region ah uh, right right yeah i put all of the above as one as one option in case oh uh, right yeah okay i didn't even realize that yeah so um so i now i figured out how to how to do the poll as you could actually close it when the most of the votes come in i'm going to close it and then i'm going to um, we'll launch it so that everybody could see the results. I, that, was oh, my first, okay. that was my first poll, the first one. So, <laughs> uh, so I'll just wait. Most, um, if you haven't voted, send your votes in and then I'll close it. Um, okay. There's another question in the meantime, maybe you can answer is about, um, if you have time, can you explain how, uh, carbon is lost from exposed soils? And that's from Steven Zine again, which I probably didn't pronounce his name properly. Um, so carbon is lost from exposed soils um, because, well, there there are numerous reasons. Um, one is that the um, there's more oxidation that takes place when soils are exposed to the air, and uh, so that ends up releasing more carbon dioxide. And then um, it a lot of the organisms in the soil are killed off and so as they decay that releases carbon dioxide that doesn't necessarily get taken up by other organisms right away. Uh, so I, I, I need, that's something I need to do a little more research on but there's, I know those are two of the ways and I, uh, there may be some other ways as well. Okay, so um, what we're going to do now is I'm going to close the poll and 83% of people voted, and then I'm going to share the results. There we go. So you can see them, right, Sylvan? Uh, no. <laughs> you can. It does say sharing poll results, but I don't get to see them. Huh. Okay. Well, I'm wondering if ever, no one else can see them. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what the answer. You all see the poll results? Audience? I see them. Okay. Well. A bunch of people say they see them, so I'm not sure why you can't see them. It may be that I would have to minimize my PowerPoint presentation to see them. Oh, uh, okay. So I'll tell you. So, uh, well, 36% of people said all of the above. 26% <laughs> said more extreme periods of drought. 18% said increased frequency of high water stormwater runoff or tide. And 16% said plants flower earlier. And 4% said none of the above. So that's it. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, and so if you all have been following the news lately, of course, there's a lot of uh, controversy of, uh, about um, extreme storm events and whether that's related to climate change or not. And um, there are a lot of different arguments about that, so I'm not going to try to go into that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Everybody was so nice. They all emailed me that they can see them. So that's great. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I think you need to hide the poll results again. Oh, okay. Right. Sorry. <laughs> okay. There we go. Okay. All right. The last cycle I'm going to talk about is the nitrogen cycle. Um, humans have also had a big impact on nitrogen. It exists in the atmosphere in gaseous forms and then it's fixed or converted to forms that are usable by plants and animals through the action of bacteria or lightning. Plants take up nitrogen in the form of nitrates mainly, and that nitrogen is passed along to animals, and when plants and animals die, it cycles within the terrestrial system. Some of it's also lost back to the atmosphere, though, as other bacteria convert it back to a gaseous form. People have contributed greatly to the amount of fixed nitrogen through the production of fertilizer, and by planting nitrogen-fixing crops like soybeans. We add to gaseous forms of nitrogen when we burn fossil fuels. Humans have doubled the amount of nitrogen fixation through the production of chemical fertilizers and the planting of nitrogen-fixing crops like soybeans, which is something that's planted frequently around here, and so I see them every day and have realized just how many of them there are. Um, the enrichment of soils from um, chemical fertilizers, manure, and the deposition of atmospheric nitrogen have resulted in the loss of diversity in some ecosystems, particularly those in which the plants were adapted to low nutrient soils. Often diversity is inversely related to nutrient availability because one species is more likely to dominate in a nutrient-rich system. And so this is why sometimes if you're trying to establish a meadow uh, in an area where there's been a lot of nitrogen enrichment, you may have a lot of weed problems. And if you can reduce the amount of nitrogen in the soil before you do your uh, planting of native species, you will have more success, you may have more success anyway, at keeping weeds out and encouraging native, uh, more diverse native population, populations of plants or more diverse community of native plants. Deforestation and other forms of land clearing have led to increases in nitrate flow in streams and nitrous oxide loss to the atmosphere. When land is cleared, there's no longer vegetation to take up nitrogen produced during decomposition, and that nitrogen is washed away into streams or it's released to the atmosphere. The vegetation also took up large quantities of water that without the forest in place leaches nutrients out of the ground. Potassium and calcium are often leached out of soils along with nitrates when there's deforestation. When this nutrient-enriched runoff reaches lakes and rivers, it can result in eutrophication or the over-fertilization of water, and that can lead to har harmful algal blooms and a loss of oxygen in the waters. Some of the nitrogen in manure and urine is also volatilized back into the atmosphere, and along with the release of nitrogen nitrous oxide from the burning of oil and coal, this contributes to acid rain. Nitrogen is only one of the elements in soils that will make a difference in how well the plants you select will thrive. So always do soil tests before deciding whether you need nutrient applications on a site and try to select plants that will thrive in the existing soil conditions. Or, you know, like as I mentioned before, maybe you need to reduce the nutrient levels if you're trying to establish a certain type of community. Look for signs that water features, such as small ponds and lakes, are not being harmed by the over-application of nutrients as well. All right, so are there any questions that didn't get answered during the last poll about uh, ecosystem processes? Um, Sylvan, I have some questions from people, so sorry. Okay, so um, the first one's from Kate Stafford, and she's like, how does increased CO2 in the atmosphere cause increased poison ivy toxicity and increased ragweed pollen production? So, um, you know, plants, uh, plants can grow faster if they have more carbon dioxide available, and so um, 
the the increased carbon dioxide levels and probably to a certain extent the increased temperatures is uh, in combination with that um, as long as those plants have plenty of access to water and nutrients then they're able to um, to produce basically more flowers and more biomass and uh, more seeds um, so you know if ragweed is uh, growing more quickly and producing more biomass, then part of that is likely to be producing more flowers and therefore more pollen. And same thing with the um, with the poison ivy. It's expensive for a plant to produce toxins um, that deter predators, which is basically what the oils and poison ivy do. And so, um, you know, if it has plenty of resources available, then it can um, uh, then it's essentially it has more resources available to produce toxins to deter predators. Um, and that research um, was mainly, the, the papers I've read have been by uh, Louis Ziska, who works for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. His last name is Z-I-S-K-A, if you want to look up their research. And I unfortunately forgot to put, or I didn't think to put his paper on the um, resource list, but I can amend that and repost it. Okay. So, okay. Do you want the next question? Sure. Um, this is from Tony Bailey. Um, and the question is, is it a bad idea to plant cover crops like clover as a means of soil conditioning? Ah, <laughs> um, hi, Tony. I know you. Um, so, <laughs> um, it's not necessarily a bad idea if you are trying to increase the nitrogen level um, in, a, in a certain location. Um, but you might want to think about planting a cover crop that would use up nitrogen um, in, if you're trying to establish, if you're trying to lower the nutrient conditions um, on a plot. And so, you know, planting a cover crop, um, you, you just need to think about what your goals for that cover crop are. Is it just to reduce weeds or are you trying to increase or decrease soil nutrients as well? Okay. Okay, the next question, I don't know if this is too general, but it's from Regina Irizarry, and it says, how can one reduce nitrogen levels? Nitrogen levels are usually reduced by adding um, sawdust or uh, wood chips to soil. Um, there have also been some experiments adding sulfur, which will also bind up uh, some of the nitrogen. Um, so it's usually done on a smaller scale, but um, but that's that's how people would reduce nitrogen usually in a like say if you were trying to establish a meadow. Okay, so I guess that's the. I mean, I, that was a, someone else asked the same question, and then this person Thomas. I can't pronounce your last name, Thomas, I'm sorry. But when establishing a meadow in an area with elevated nitrogen levels, how would you reduce levels of nitrogen? So that's a wider area. So is that the same answer or any? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, oh, that was a popular question. Wait, I'm just going through some. Okay. <laughs> um, oh, okay. Uh, Anna Best asked, at, at some point at the end, we explain how to access the resource list. So, um, Everybody will get a follow-up email to this webinar, I'm hoping, but I, that's, that's the plan. And then it should have a link to a page, right, that you put up, Sylvan, correct? Yes, that's right. Well, it's actually um, on the Chesapeake Conservation Landscaping Council uh, webinar page right now. But Okay. So, and, and that email probably will go out in, in maybe two or three days because we also want to include a link to the recorded webinar. So we're just playing with understanding that. So, um, but, but, um, so that's our hope. Okay, let's see. Um, okay, this is Tracy Neal. Won't growing plants that use loss of nitrogen delete nitrogen store, stores? Uh, it can, yeah. Um, so that would be another approach to take if you were, um, you know, if you can do a rotation, or if you if you're sort of planning a successional process in your in your plantings, that you could start out with a plant that that uses a lot of nitrogen, and um, and then uh, that would deplete the nitrogen in the soil a little bit, and then you could plant plants that um, preferred low nitrogen soils. Hi, Tracy. <laughs> 
Okay, so the next question is from someone I know, Monique. Hi, Monique. Um, she says, would milky oats or buckwheat use up nitrogen in the soil? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I would need to look up what plants are heavy, uh, heavy users of nitrogen, and I don't know whether those two are or not. Okay, that's a smart question, Monique. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Does anyone else in the audience happen to know? Yeah, you can pause that in the questions. Users? Um, well, Carol, Carol, I don't, Carol Jellich said, maybe you could plant a corn crop to take it up. Is that, <laughs> <laughs> you're laughing, but I don't get the joke. But <laughs> oh, well, so corn, corn is a very heavy feeder. And so, um, oh. so corn, you know, if you, if you <laughs> wanted to plant a corn crop and then take it out, um, then you probably would end up using up nitrogen that's in the soil. Oh, okay. And then Hillary said monocots. Yeah, so corn is a monocot. You know, monocots are grasses um, okay. and some other plants. But um, so, yeah, so planting a grass is likely to, uh, I guess, monocots might in general be heavy users of nitrogen. Okay, got it. Okay, thank you. So any other questions? I think we've gone through them. I like this question thing. It's really easy and it's so fun. <laughs> okay. Um, Okay, here. So, okay. Oh, we got a few more questions. So, Terry Enright, is there a resource to look at the lists plant at the list plants? Okay, is there, in other words, can you look up plants according to their nitrogen uptake? Is there any place, a resource to look that up? <laughs> Not that I know of, but I will um, see if I can find something. Does anyone else know of a good resource for that? Okay, let's see. Um, um, then just a little comment from Stephen Zine again. Is some nitrogen also leaches out of the soil fairly quickly when irrigated? So I guess yes, that's true too. So if you if if water is not a um, limited resource for you, then you could um, you could water your soils. Although you have to think maybe about where the nitrogen is going if you do that. Oh right, right. It could flow downstream into something else. Yeah. Right. Okay, well, let me go on then to the last section of the talk. Um, so now we're going to be stepping down to look uh, at communities. And this is more at the, um, what I tend to get excited about and what I've done the most research on are communities and habitats. Um, so different land uses and the disturbance regimes that we talked about lead to different communities of species. So for example, this great blue heron thrives in a community that's made up of fish, frogs, wild rice, ash, and red maple trees, cattails, wood ducks, muskrats, beaver, and many other organisms. So the community is the assemblage of all the species in a given area. Its habitat, the physical space that provides the environment and resources needed for a population to survive and reproduce, so the habitat for this um, Blue heron population includes the wetland where its food sources live and trees to build uh, huge nests in. The roadrunner, on the other hand, lives in a desert and pinyon juniper or grassland habitat where it feeds on lizards, small snakes, insects, and mice. It nests in the choya cactus and in low trees and shrubs, making a nest of twigs lined with grasses. A garden is a community of plants that you have assembled, as well as the critters that come to pollinate, disperse seeds, and eat the plants. And of course, humans are a critical element of any, um, of any garden or landscape that you've created for people to use. You create habitat for these species by providing space, food, water, and shelter. And so this little bunny rabbit here is um, enjoying the newly planted Santa Fe Botanic Garden. Even though all of these organisms share a habitat, they do not have exactly the same environmental and resource requirements. Reaching a particular species, researching a particular species niche requires learning about its life cycle, resource needs, and the other organism the species associates with. So a niche is all of the environmental conditions and resources that are required to maintain a viable population of a species. Concepts like companion planting and intercropping come from learning what plants' niches complement each other. So for example, these bean plants 
are providing nitrogen that feeds the Swiss chard here, and the alyssum is attracting, um, is attracting pollinators that will pollinate the bean plants. Thinking about the functions that an organism plays in the environment can help in grouping species that play a similar role. For example, species can be grouped by their trophic level or their place in the food chain. So producers, so producers um, are the plants that are uh, fixing, um, that are getting energy from the um, from sunlight to to produce carbon. Produ um, herbivores are the uh, plant are the animals that eat the plants, and then carnivores are animals that eat other animals. So those are all examples of different functional groups in a trophic system. But you can also group species by, um, in addition to how they obtain food, you can also group them by other types of interactions. So interactions that benefit both organisms, such as pollination or, de or seed dispersal, are referred to as mutualisms. Parasites, on the other hand, benefit from their host, but the host suffers in the interaction. And then there are other functional groups like nitrogen fixtures, the uh, legumes and some other species, um, competitors, predators, those would all be examples of functional groups. In many of the areas where we work, particularly urban areas, a particular functional group might be missing or depleted, so you'd have to think about whether you can restore that group. So for example, um, there are top predators like wolves and bobcats um, that are that have that are missing in most of our urban and suburban areas now, and as a consequence, deer have really uh, deer populations have exploded, and to a certain extent, um, cars have taken over as a top predator of deer in many urban areas, although much to the detriment of people, unfortunately. Because of the decline in honeybee populations, there's also renewed interest in agriculture and horticulture in native pollinators. And so I wanted to focus on the functional group of pollinators for a minute here. Honeybees, of course, originated in Europe and Africa. Um, habitat loss, pesticide use, and diseases are contributing to the decline in populations of pollinators. But by reducing pesticide use and creating and conserving pollinator habitat, we can help out native pollinators. Some of the most common native pollinators include um, solitary bees like this mason bee and bumblebees. Wasps, flies, butterflies, and hummingbirds also pollinate some flowers. Uh, interestingly, yellow jackets and the European black and yellow paper wasps are also not native, even though they may sometimes be found on a plant, although yellow jackets not so much. Um, I wanted to just talk to mention briefly these organ-shaped um, mud tubes are made by the mud dauber wasp, which is a good pollinator. And I was fascinated by these guys as a kid because they would build the nest on the side of our house all the time. And they stuff these nests full of paralyzed spiders. And then the wasp lays its egg on the, on the paralyzed spiders, and the larvae uh, eat the spiders before growing into an adult wasp. So that's just one of the amazing um, pollinating insects. This block down, this block of wood down here, is a mason bee nest, and it's um, very easy to make these. It's just a wooden block with uh, holes drilled in it, and then the mason bees will um, nest in the holes and plug up the end of the hole there until the uh, larvae grow and, and hatch out. So I think we have one final poll here, if Lisa can pull that up. Do you see that? I launched it. What functional groups do soybeans belong to? Oh, people are voting. This should be a quick poll. Okay, the votes are coming in. Just wait for a few more. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. 
Okay, so we're going to close the poll and then we're going to share results. And so Sylvan, you can't see them, but 51% um, said that soybeans belong to nit the group nitrogen fixer and 41% said all of the above. And, and right, so I, I, if I remember my answer correctly, I think all of the above is the uh, correct answer, but certainly nit nitrogen fixer is how most of us, is one of the functions of soybeans that most of us think about. Yeah, the other uh, choices were producer, competitor, insect, host, plant. Ah, yes, right, right. Well, as the uh, kudzu bug makes its way north, um, it's found to, it feeds not only on kudzu, which is probably a good thing, but it also feeds on soybeans, which farmers consider a bad thing. So there, mm. is, there it is as one example of an insect host. All right, so um, if you want to close that, I'm just going to put up my final slide, and then I'll uh, take more questions. So you could describe the ultimate goal of using ecological principles in landscaping as being to conserve biodiversity. And biodiversity is uh, not just the number and distribution of species in an ecosystem, but it's also the diversity of genes within species, communities within ecosystems, and ecosystems within landscapes. Biodiversity has economic importance as well as ec ecological value. And to most of us, it also has cultural and intrinsic value. So from an ecological perspective, more diverse ecosystems tend to be more stable in the face of disturbances, and they recover faster or are more resilient after a disturbance. They also tend to perform ecosystem functions better, such as slowing and cleaning stormwater runoff, absorbing and storing carbon dioxide, and providing resources for people. So designers and landscapers can promote biodiversity by including native plants and gardens. And um, also, I should add, by including um, not just cultivars of native plants, but also straight species of native plants, because the species tend to have more genetic diversity, um, providing wildlife habitat, controlling invasive species, which often uh, lessen diversity or um, uh, have negative impacts on wildlife, minimizing the use of pesticides and herbicides, retaining and reusing stormwater runoff, and reusing and recycling materials. So I hope this webinar has given you some new ecological principles to think about in designing, installing, and maintaining landscapes. I know it was a very quick overview of a lot of ecological principles, but, um, uh, but I hope that you've learned something, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have.